It's the most comprehensive overhaul of youth football in the history of England's professional game. The goal is to create a larger pool of highly skilled homegrown players. But is there a danger smaller clubs could be sacrificed at the altar of the academy revolution? Hello and welcome to the special report live from Sky Studios. At the start of next season, the academies of all 92 professional football clubs will be governed by a new and controversial set of rules. The elite player performance plan is the brainchild of the Premier League and represents a seismic shift in the coaching of our children. On tonight's programme, we'll assess the issues and work out who will be the winners and the losers. Joining me in the studio this evening, Tony Carr, Director of Youth Development at West Ham, Watford Head of Youth, Nick Cox, and Crystal Palace Co-Chairman, Steve Parrish. We're going to hear from our panel shortly. First, though, here's Carve Solical. football is not doing enough to create a sustainable future for its clubs. That's the hard-hitting conclusion of a House of Commons report into how football is run in England. The FA and the Premier League believe the elite player performance plan will revolutionise the development of the game. But critics say it will lead to clubs going out of business with big clubs buying the best young players at knockdown prices. English football is not just about the Premier League, it's about those supporters who support their local club and have the passion of going to Torquay, Akron Stanley, etc. The Elite Player Performance Plan is being designed to absolutely give the most boys the best chance, the best possible development. Under the new plans, club academies will be divided into four categories. Category 1 academies will have access to the best young players. They must have an annual budget of at least £2.3 million, excellent facilities and 18 full-time staff. Category 2 academies will have less time to spend with players. They'll be able to train boys from 4 and sign them at 9. Category 3 academies will have no access to boys under 11. Category 4 academies will be a safety net, taking on release players and late developers. Peterborough United want to become a Category 2 club. They've already made big changes to their youth setup. Their stars of tomorrow receive a full-time education at a local school, right next to the club's training ground. Very, very, very important that we retain our focus on our education. We're always saying to you how important it is to keep on top of things and to achieve academically. No guarantees from the football club at all. The David and Goliath story, you see what we've done under our manager Darren Ferguson, we're doing a magnificent job um, in terms of where we're lying in the league, we've had a real strong philosophy of developing young players and getting them through, giving them opportunities to play first team football here at London Road um, and then moving those players on and ultimately we could potentially lose the ability to be able to do that. Everyone agrees that standards need to rise to reach the benchmark set by clubs like Barcelona. Simply the best, Barcelona. But the Premier League's tactics have been controversial. Is it a fait accompli? It's, 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 it has, let, look, it's take this deal or we're not going to cut you, we're going to cut your funding. So at the absolute basic level, uh, you have to say yes. And we've never really put any strings or any conditions attached to it uh, in the past. But in order to move the thing on, yes, the youth we weren't going to continue funding youth development to the tune we were funding it, you know, if we weren't going to achieve some of these qualitative objectives. Lower league clubs like Torquay are also concerned about the scrapping of the 90-minute rule. From next season, clubs can recruit young players from anywhere in England. You know, they could take, you know, the, the little diamond from from Torquay uh, and take them to school in, in Manchester and I'm sure they'll do everything uh, in their powers to, to make sure his welfare is okay. I'm just not sure if that's right. You know, we'll have agents and we'll have um, people looking at kids at 12 years of age. When is it going to stop? The idea that this has never happened before, is, it's always happened. There is always a predator club 
in this whole system. And it depends on who you are as to whether you're being taken from or you're taken. There's not a club I know in professional football who isn't taken from, from levels below. Then there's the issue of compensation. Chairmen like Brian Fenton keep their clubs in business by selling young players. In future, they'll get thousands, not millions of pounds. The maximum a selling club will receive for a young player is £130,000. But Premier League appearances will trigger more payments. You've got to have the Premier League because that's where the money is. I think it's like being, being with a big stick at times, that if you don't do that, you don't get this. And I think that's where we are. And that, I think that's the story of football today. The Elite Player Performance Plan is an opportunity to revolutionise youth development. But the important question is this. Has it been designed to benefit the Premier League or the whole of football? OK, let's get the thoughts of our guests in the studio then. Uh, Tony, Nick and Steve. Tony, start with you first of all. Uh, a simple, basic question. Are the changes a good or a bad thing for the future of football in the UK? Well, I love a lot, a lot of changes. You know, there's Some are going to be very beneficial to some clubs and some are going to feel that they're losing out and it's not good for them but I think you've got to take it in the whole and I think overall I think it will improve the system overall I think it will improve the quality of the players in the long term. Nick do you feel that way? Yeah I think there absolutely there's going to be some changes that will be beneficial for football um, and the game and our national side I think everyone's in agreement with raising standards but there's certainly some contentious issues in there as well that I think could probably moving forward damage uh, some of the clubs at the lower leagues. Steve, do you see it as um, being designed to benefit perhaps uh, the Premier League or the whole of football in its entirety, the changes that are being made? I think it's worse than that. I think it benefits the top Premier League clubs. I think even for the clubs at the bottom of the Premier League, they're going to be prone to having their players stolen at a young age. I think for us, we probably feel more strongly about it. You know, We've got four of our current academy playing in the first team at the moment. They present us with an opportunity to fulfil the dream of trying to get to the next level and to have those players taken away from us at 16 years old when we've coached them from 8 to 16 for, for tiny amounts of money we think is, is, is really bad for the game. Is it not a good thing though that the authorities are trying to think of ways, they're trying to create ways to improve the national setup? Well, the national setup for what? The to national what end? game, the national team. But the national team is currently made up of 11 players that play in Football League academies or came from Football League academies. The notion that the Premier League teams have somehow got a monopoly on all the best coaches, we think is a, is a misnomer. Our under-18s went this Saturday and beat Chelsea 4-0 at their training ground. So, you know, we must be doing something right. Um, and we think this assumption that, that the best coaches are necessarily in the top Premier League clubs is a bit of a misnomer as well. We don't think that's necessarily the case. Uh, the Forest Academy director, who we heard from uh, just now in that package, and uh, Nick Marshall, says that he thinks it was a, a fait accompli. Do you think that's the case, Nick? Um, I think certainly a lot of decisions were made a long time ago before some of the football league clubs were, were made aware of the, the situation. Um, I think clubs have tried to have an influence, but definitely this has been driven by the Premier League. It's been driven by some of the top clubs in the Premier League, and uh, it will ultimately suit them better than perhaps some of the, the lower league clubs. What was the consultation process before this went through between the Premier League, the Football League and the clubs? How, how big a consultation process was I that? I think totally? initially, because we were a Premier League club last season, mm. so I had some dealings with the, the meetings that were going and taking place. And there were subcommittees within, uh, prior to the meetings as well to sort of look at all the aspects of the, um, the EPPP. But uh, basically the Premier League drove it uh, with the FA's uh, blessing, I believe. And, um, and then they sort of, in effect, once they got the, the nuts and bolts of it together, they started then to uh, involve the Football League clubs and ask them you know, how they felt about this and how, where they sat with it. You were in the meeting, weren't you, Nick, of the 72 Football League clubs who were chewing the fat and working out uh, where the winners and losers were in this particular deal. What was that like? Just give us a bit of an insight into, into how that unfolded and um, the mood in the room. It was very passionate. There was maybe a two-hour debate <coughs> prior to us voting. And I think there was real two elements that the people were looking at. I think everyone was in full agreement that some of the changes were for the good of the game. We want to see better coaches, we want to see people spend more time with their players. There was no arguments there. Where there was real friction and real strong debate was around compensation and the reduced figures that clubs might get if one of their players moves to another club. And the issue of funding. Um, the, the fear that funding might be cut 